welcome to this uh, special edition of the NAVS channel. NAVS stands for Narcissistic Abuse Victim and Survivors, which I am one of, and decided to launch a channel to really bring more awareness, education, tools for people to heal, start a conversation, open up about it. I hid my own issue uh, with narcissistic abuse for all my life. I just started really opening up about it. And I realized that the more I opened up, the more other people opened up, the more I felt healed, the more I felt like I was not crazy. I was not the only one. And I felt re reassured in my own, I say, well-being. And, and I really felt that inner sense of healing. And I thought, wow, so if I feel that this way, maybe I can bring this to much more people so that we all collectively can help one another, support each other, and heal uh, together uh, from uh, these, uh, this abuse that a lot of people are actually experiencing in their personal life, in their work life. So um, I hope you will join us and, of course, share uh, this uh, information so that many more come and watch uh, these videos. Also, you can see the links that are below on a Facebook group that I started. There's also a website called NarcissisticAbusedVictims.com where you can have more information about fundraising that I am doing to uh, create a documentary to bring more awareness, but also create a fund that I think is essential to have a wallet to wallet, uh, free interest lending to victims so that they can escape because often enough the abuser controls the wallet and the victims are locked in not having financial aid. So these are very important to me. I hope they are as important to you. Uh, in the following uh, videos that you will see here, you will have interviews with experts, interviews with victims, survivors, book authors, um, because I feel we can have a conversation with everyone that has any experience in this field. And even if it's just a survivor and it's not just a survivor world, they can bring us understanding about how they went through and how they survived so that many more can benefit from that experience and that knowledge. So that being said, welcome. Thank you uh, for being here. And I have a wonderful lady with me. Uh, Nikki Cole, who is a survivor, and I feel so thankful to having you today uh, to talk to me about this, um, because I believe you as well have not really opened up about this subject, so I, I hope you feel safe and, and really comfortable talking about it today, and thank you for opening up. I think the more people open up, the less people will be able to hide behind their narcissistic behavior. So thank you and welcome, Nikki. Thank you so much, Slavika. And um, this is a really wonderful thing that you're doing. I must commend you. Uh, as you <laughs> mentioned, this is something that I, I've never really talked about publicly before. And uh, I think that this, I'm hoping this will give other people an opportunity to um, think about their situation, see what they can do to help themselves. I'm hearing a little bit of an echo. Are you hearing the echo? No, I'm fine on my end. Okay, then I'm going to just ignore it <laughs> on mine and I'll keep going. Um, and please tell me, so what, first I, I'm curious to see why you felt like opening up today. Well, I think it, it was a very, very long time ago for me. And it was something that I was, as you mentioned, I wouldn't say ashamed. I would, in my case, I felt humiliated that even though I was young, very young at the time, this was a marriage I was in, and it was with a, what you call a narcissistic, narcissistic abuser. And that when I read that, I was like, yes, that's how I would describe him. He was, had all kinds of other problems as well. But when I, when I thought about it, I realized that he's passed away at now, and it's years later. And I, I'm actually, in a crazy sort of strange way, grateful for the experience that I had when I was quite young because I, I learned so much. And it became the first building block of my own healing on other levels because I think there are reasons that 
certain kinds of people get attracted to narcissistic abusers. And so for me, it was starting to understand myself since then, I've done a lot of therapy thinking about why I was attracted to this person in the first place. And um, in my case, because I was a strong young woman with goals and ideas and things I wanted to do in life, I realize now that I had been confined by societal and familial pressure to not follow my own dreams. And I, I found that I was very attracted to, and I have always been attracted to strong, artistic, fearless men. And it's only years later that I started to realize that that was in my way of, because I didn't feel confident myself in pursuing my own real dreams, I subverted into their dreams. Uh, and so I'm not sure if this is making sense. I'm kind of rambling. No, no, it does. It does. So what do you think, what makes you think he was a narcissistic abuser? What were the traits that he had during the, the so he, he was very charming and very bright. I think his IQ was 250. And, and I have a high IQ. And at that time in my life, I didn't realize it, but I had a very low so that's your intelligent quotient, intelligence quotient. I had a very low emotional quotient. I was very emotionally immature and didn't realize it at the time. So I sort of got swept off my feet by a charming, good looking, um, fearless artist. And I think one of the main draws was that he was actually the first person that saw the artist in me. And was very encouraging of me and my own artistic drives and and it, even before I was aware of what they were he was he was very astute he saw things in me that I didn't even know existed and I, I think that's actually what swept me off my feet more than anything else because that was the that was the part of my life that had been denied to me previously by family by society and in those years um, I was constantly being told, you need to manage, you need to learn your limitations. That's what I heard my whole growing up years. You need to learn your limitations. And I kept saying, why? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was only years later that I, I really said, that's nonsense. But these are things you absorb because it's, you hear it over and over and over again. And he was the first person that came along and said, you're great. You've got, you know, you've really got something as an artist. You've got, I was a choreographer at the time. Well, I wasn't a choreographer. I was a dancer, but he saw the choreographer in me. He saw the artist in me. He saw the creator in me. And so I think that was the main draw. What I didn't understand was that by falling for that and, and sort of getting swept up in that, what I didn't realize is that that in his mind gave him some kind of ownership over me because he was the one that saw it. So therefore I became in his mind, his protege in a way, Of course, you know, it wasn't that he was that much older than me. He was only a couple of years younger than me. We were both young. I was just turning 20. He was 22. And so, you know, it was wild and crazy years, but because he was so fearless, it sort of gave me a sense of, well, maybe I can be a little bit more fearless too. Um, I didn't even appear to be, uh, to others I appeared fearless already, but to myself deep inside, I had a ton of insecurities as one does at that age, as one does as an artist, as one does. So he, I don't know if it was conscious or otherwise on his part, but he really took advantage of that. So that he, he, would, he kept trying to push me to do things that I actually wasn't ready to do. And, and I kept saying, I remember saying, I don't have anything to say yet. <laughs> I, I, you may see these talents and these skills in me, but I actually don't have anything to say, but he kept pushing and pushing and pushing. So that was one area that sort of went from something being very powerfully good to being something that was really 
um, annoying. And also at the same time, I began to see other things, other things began to emerge in the relationship in that. Do you think that he was pushing you to show you that you're not good enough as a manipulative way that you would have to admit that you're not at le that level? Because often narcissists, they like to bring someone really high and then pull them really low. And so, you know, to show that actually you're not that good enough. Uh, could that have been that? That's or? very interesting, Slavica. I never thought about it. That could be. That could be. Um, but I, at the time, it just felt that he was, he was being manipulative and he was pushing. At the same time, he, in his fearlessness, turned out to not actually want to do any work <laughs> to pay the rent. <laughs> so... Yeah. I ended up paying the rent, um, but he was so powerful mentally that he had me convinced constantly that his talent was worth supporting. Really, we were supporting both of our talents, but really, we were, I was supporting us, and that he had ways and means of making money that I didn't appreciate or even find legal necessarily, but I didn't know that. I, I did, I, I married him very quickly. I mean, it was young and stupid. I, I, <laughs> I really learned my lesson from that. But it, the main thing he did was he took me away from my family and my, and my friends and um, literally across the country. And that's when I started to really begin to feel him enclosing on me and manipulating me and mentally manipulating me in a way that I really thought that he knew best. <laughs> it's so crazy to me when I think about it now. And that anytime my own instincts would come up of, of saying, you know, this isn't right. And I don't think that we should, he, he would squelch that. And we would have terrible, terrible arguments. And then when I would say, I, I need to leave, I need to get out of here. I need to clear my mind because my mind was clouded. That was really what it was. My mind became very clouded by him. And that's when things became, started to become violent. Wow. Every time I would try to even just physically leave to go out for a walk. So I became more and more um, restricted in my actions and in my thoughts. And, and he had me convinced, this is the insane part to me, that the violence was my fault because oh, yeah. I was, pushing him so hard because I was arguing because I was I was raised by a family that really encouraged encouraged I, <laughs> I don't know if that's too strong a word but we would get into arguments they were they were you know I I would always state my case I was not used to someone telling me that I couldn't be heard I I and so I would argue with him and he didn't like that and and so things would escalate and somehow he had me convinced that this was all my fault, that I, if I would just be a better wife, if I would just stop arguing with him, if I would stop pushing him, if I stopped pushing him, then he wouldn't lose his temper, etc. So Yes, it's, it's often a trait of narcissists um, that it's isolation of the victim uh, is, is one. Uh, we all get completely isolated. Nobody is good enough to be our friends anymore, surprisingly, suddenly. Yes. And yes. the further the better, they, they lure us. Uh, I was involved, uh, unfortunately, I, I was not only in my family, but after that in relationships with narcissists. And that should be a big red flag. Yes. If they try to take you away and bring you to a beautiful, amazing new place where you know no one, that's yeah. one flag. And number two, if none of your friends are good enough or they convince you of all the flaws your friends are, they're so horrible that you and plan like fights with you and your friends, that's a second big red flag. So yes, I totally agree with you. And then I'm, I'm sorry to hear uh, that they were violent, but I, I understand because narcissists cannot accept being at fault. They cannot accept being imperfect. So your retaliation just showed him his imperfections and where he was flawed. And, and the, 
the, the violence of a narcissist is uncomparable to anyone else. Yes, it, and it was interesting because after I left, which we'll get to in a minute, the details of how I, how I did eventually leave, he stalked me for years. Wow. He, he was, he, and I lived in many different countries, different places, and he kept stalking me. And I think that's the other reason why I didn't speak about it now because he's passed away. But I, it was like, just, I just want, never wanted to give him an opportunity to find me because he did, no matter what he did, he was very, very smart. And, and that's very interesting what you are saying about the friends, because he would point out, um, it, we not weaknesses, but things about my friends that weren't perfect. I mean, he, he, it wasn't that he was wrong. It was that he would take these things and his very astute observations, and as well as my reactions to those issues that I would have with my friends, because everyone has issues with their friends, and he would build on them and he would, he would make his case. He was a writer and brilliant with words, just brilliant with words. So he, he really truly manipulated my mind. And that for me was the hardest thing to accept because I had, I was always a strong person, mentally strong. I never thought that I would end up in a situation like that which is why I probably, uh, you know, I didn't stay that long in the marriage. I think it was a year, but it was a year of hell. But I, I couldn't, I didn't, I didn't have, in those days, there was no place to go. I didn't even want to admit that I was in that situation. It was so, it, I, I did not, it did not fit the image of me and the life that I was going to live. I was not someone who, who would ever end up in that. I knew that women and men, people ended up in that situation, but I could not believe that it was me. So I basically struggled for, I think it was a year um, and without saying anything to anyone. And it, it wasn't until a very close friend came to visit us in that city and she didn't even have to say anything. It was just her being there made me go, oh my God, what, what's happened to me? What, where am, look at where I am. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I was sort of pushing it down for yeah. so long. Because it's the mirror, right? She, she is your mirror of who you should be. And suddenly you realize I'm no longer that person I, I am. Exactly. Who am I? Exactly. And how come I'm, I'm in that such a low place of myself? Yes. Yes. Totally. Because you had that finally that mirror of of recognition of the person you were with her. Exactly. And you have not probably. It's like that uh, that story we say about the frog going in water and getting boiled over time and not yes. noticing, and yes. the other person coming into boiling water and going, "Oh my gosh, this is horrible." But us in the situation because it's gradual and it started with such a big wow. I think we have a tendency to go back to that wow place that was so wow, thinking that wow will come back at some point. Yes. And we, we, we are dragged down in a path of, of hell thinking, but no, the, the image, the first impression and the image we have of that person is that they're this grand, amazing, extraordinary human being. Yes. And we kind of want to cling on that they'll really become that one day. Me too. And you know, my inner deep self knew from the beginning that this was not right, but I wouldn't listen. I mean, I, I, I had to be on tranquilizers to marry him. Like I, I've never been on tranquilizers before or since, but it was like, and my father even sensed it. So it happened very quickly. He, this guy really swept me off my feet and he had swept me off my feet away from a relationship that my parents didn't like. And they seemed to like this guy. They liked his brilliance, in fact. But my father took me out the day before the wedding. And he said, look, if you don't want to do this, you can send the gifts back. You can, you know, send, you can cancel. You don't have to do this. And I was like, but I was so stubborn. And I was so used to doing what I wanted to do. And I was very young. And I said, no, I'm going to do this. I'm, I'm going to make this work. So silly now when I think about it. So it, the, 
it was all very obvious, even to myself, but I wouldn't pay attention. And, and I think that's sort of the biggest takeaway. I think I can, that over the yes, year. We I, want to make, we want not to fail. We're so strong and we're so, we feel so powerful that we don't want to have to show the failure. <clears throat> we want to show that our decision was right and we'll prove everyone that our decision is the right one, no matter what. And like you say, I thought the same thing with my marriage. I'm going to make this work. Like it's work, right? And and second, like it's our it's our own responsibility, nobody else's. Like and and after for me was also hiding. I hid a lot of the negative negativity of the relationship, so I wouldn't look like I made a mistake. Yes, which when I you think about it, is vanity on our part, right? Yes. It's it's vanity. It's like. And just even saying it's my responsibility to make this work. It's like, it's our responsibility to make a marriage work. But at that point I was so, I needed so much to prove myself and I was so insecure and I, and I never wanted to do what my parents wanted me to do. So I was so used to being in that sort of rebellious mode that the more they said, you know, maybe you shouldn't do this the more. I said, no, no, I'm doing this. And, and it, it's, it's youth. It's, it's, insecurity it's it's all those things that you build up this sort of armor and then he plays on that because I, he he knew that i didn't want to appear to be in a bad marriage and therefore and he knew that it was i was taking on the work and therefore whenever he would say if you would just be a better wife if you wouldn't argue with me then i would go right okay so i'm gonna keep my mouth shut i'm gonna Again, even saying those words now are so not me. And it was so long ago. So it's really interesting. I'm still feeling humiliation in a way, but now I forgive myself because I was young, because I see much more clearly. And, and now I don't even call myself a survivor. I call myself a thriver. Because That's great. I love it. Because that really was the first step towards me through that failure. It's really a failure, whatever you want to call it, to that mess, <laughs> which I had to pick myself up from. And I did um, from that day onwards, from the day that my friend arrived and, and he, he got violent in front of her. Wow. And, we, and with her by my side, we walked out. Oh, and now, wow. I'm in, now I'm in a strange city and I don't really know anybody. I found a distant relative. I kind of parked her there. <laughs> and I spent the next two days just walking. I walked all over that city, just, just thinking, just, you know, by myself, didn't tell him where I was, didn't tell him where she was, like, which is the thing that drove him crazy is not being in control of the situation, not knowing where I was. And, but I needed that time by myself and I just took it. And then when I came back to our apartment, he was locked in the bathroom threatening suicide oh wow and I'm like now i'm being held an emotional hostage that if i don't you know tell him that everything's gonna be fine and we're gonna do it then and it was my friend who pointed out to me he said you know he's holding you hostage and I said, okay, so I started negotiating with him, started negotiating. And I, I, I said, okay, I was like, again, we, I don't remember that we had any money except what I was making. I, I just don't remember. And I said, okay, I'm going to, if you're in this bad shape and you're like suicidal, I'm going to get you a plane ticket and I'm going to send you to your mother. <laughs> oh, wow. And I did, I put him on a plane and sent him halfway across the country to his mother. And I took a job as a dancer at the time. I took a job touring. I don't think I told him, I don't remember, but I mustn't have told him because I think he would have tracked me down. And then I left the country and I went to England and um, just kind of tried to forget about it. Everything. When you're young, you think, well, if I just go to another country, no one's going to know, you know, <laughs> it was harder in those days to track 
me down. And, but he did, of course, and he served me with divorce papers. And I said, gladly, <laughs> he was, he was accusing me of all sorts of things. And I was like, and my uncle, who's a, a lawyer, he said, J don't go to court over this. He'll just drag you through the mud because I had already taken up with another guy at that time. And um, so I just, I just signed it. And that was the divorce, thinking that was the end of it. Of course, being who he was, he, he stopped me for, oh my God, 20, 30 years. I mean, he just wow. never, for him, I was the one that got away. He had six marriages. <laughs> Wow. But I was, I mean, probably he was stalking all of them. I don't remember. I did see him one more time uh, in Berlin and he was just, no, I mean, if he was bad as a young man, he was horrible as an older man. He was just awful. Of course, I wasn't, I didn't fall for any of that stuff. Plus he was married and I just, he wanted to show me Berlin. I'm like, okay, let's see, let's see Berlin. It was a disaster. And it was like, and then I just, I, my fear was completely gone by this time. I, I didn't fear him anymore. He was just pathetic. Um, what do you I, think you fear? The, the violence or being found or being seen? Or is it that we are so convinced that seeing them again means death? Or what, what is it that we fear so much in being found? I think in this case, because he was so violent, it was death death or disfigurement I, I i was i once that shifted for me that day when i took that two-day walk all over town and realized the situation i was in and that i had to get myself out of it there was no looking back there was no oh i could make this work or it, it was over it was completely over so it wasn't like am i was i worried that he would um suck me back in no that, that was the past. It was really the physical violence. And um, by that time, I knew that he was mentally ill and that he would probably stop at nothing. So, and by that time, I was also educating myself about this kind of abuse and where things can, can go. Um, so, no, it was really just, uh, it was fear for my life. And that's why I didn't really talk about it until after he passed away, because... Wow. Just, he was so unpredictable in his particular case. So, yeah. and so, if you would have, um, you know, advice to give to someone who feels they are in such a relationship, like in my Facebook group, there are uh, individuals who actually currently are in such relationships. And so, if you would have, you know, advice to give them, what would you tell them? I would say plan to leave no matter what and do it carefully. Uh, as I said, in, during my time, there was, there, were no, there was no place to go. There was no uh, women's shelters. There was no, there was just, there just wasn't. So I would contact the authorities quietly. It's, I know in small towns, it's harder. Um, but I would find out what resources are there to keep you safe. Cause I think that's the physical, that's again, that was my fear was the physical, if you're in an, a physically abusive relationship to look for help and, and make your plans quietly and carefully. If there's no resources, then go to friends and family who I mean, for me, putting physical distance was the key. I, I had, at, at that time, it was just, I literally changed continents because of him. Because I knew that if I stayed in North America, he would, he'd get to me too quickly. Um, not everyone has the resources to do that. I took that job that paid for my airfare and I went, I just went. But, and not everyone, I, we did not have children, by the way. So that made it simpler. I mean, and this was something he pushed for from day one, which I always found very interesting because I knew that he, again, that was a power thing from him. Um, and of course, as now I'm a mom. And so, but at the time I was not ready to be a mom and it was something I, I stood firm on um, because when there are children involved, of course, it's, it's very tricky. It's very, very tricky. So 
Um, again, that's why I'm saying to, to proceed with caution, but proceed. Like, don't, don't not leave because, you, because you're afraid. Find the ways to do it safely. And again, I, I, it's been a long time and I don't really know what resources are out there now, but I do understand that there are community resources um, for women and their children. And in cases I know of where they, they, those resources weren't available to these women, they went to friends and they went to family and and made their exit that way. I think the key word for me is exit. Is yes, get out and get out fast. Plan yeah. your exit and then just get out. I agree with you. And um, I know some have mentioned that the abuser has isolated them so much that they don't feel they have any friends or family anymore. But I want them to send a message out there that friends and family never are cut away from you completely. Yes, exactly. So even though the abuser may have convinced you otherwise and made you feel like there are no other options and they're the only option available, that is not true. The family and friends will never let you down. You will always find one friend or one family member that can take you in or at least help you for a certain amount of time. So that is important to remember, I think. And, and also to remember that reaching out is not a sign of weakness. At that point in my life, I, I, it was about not wanting to admit it, the situation I was in. And, and I think that the abusers use that because they know that we, we were too ashamed and too humiliated to go to friends and family. But I think when you compare that to your life or the lives of your children, and, and not just physical lives, I'm, I'm talking mental, emotional, spiritual life. Is this how you want to live for the rest of your life? Because exactly. And also show your kids the example, correct? Because if you have kids, that's the example you're showing that that is okay to stay in that kind of violent, horrible uh, atmosphere. That's not what you want to educate your kids to, uh, to be agreeable with. So, and if that's their first modeling of what love is, then they go on and recreate that situation in their own lives. And so the cycle just keeps going until it's stopped, basically. Exactly. Because uh, the thing I learned is that they're not going to change. We can't change them. I, I, maybe some of them have changed or, and have seen the light. I don't know. Certainly, I was really glad that I saw him so many years later because it affirmed for me that there was nothing I could have done to change this guy. He went through six wives. <laughs> yeah, proof, and, and proof is in there. Proof. Got worse. He got worse and worse and worse. He was a horrible adult. He was a horrible but actually, the, 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 the science, the numbers show that there's none that actually change. A narcissistic abuser is an illness that as of today is uncurable. And it's a big mistake to think you will be able to change someone that cannot be changed. And as you said very correctly, unfortunately, they get worse and worse and worse, really no matter did. how. Yeah. And by the time I saw him, I was not in fear of in, in, for my life. I just saw him as a pathetic, horrible, and he wasn't cute anymore. <laughs> he wasn't attractive. And he wasn't particularly, he was still, no, I wouldn't say he was smart anymore. He he was just really lost in his in his mental illness. So somebody else is joining us, looks like. Yeah. So um so, so uh, yes, so thank you. I mean do they know, I, I'm curious to know from your research, do they know what causes narcissism? No, they don't know yet. Uh, I from everything that I've uh, read on and, and researched, um there's no uh, ex like uh, particulars that create a narcissist. Um, I've read that it can be from um, either or extremes in the way that they were raised, either too strict or too liberal mm. extremes in the way they're raised. Um, and trauma at a very uh, young age uh, could have caused that 
the need to control, the need to play a role and manipulate everybody around so that they become protected in a way by being uh, the top, like the most important, the most valuable, the most respected, the most this and that. Mm -hmm. And then potentially having been hurt or viol violated for not being good enough and having that profound insecurity that they have to always be perfect and be like the best and never accepting any flaws because that would mean that potentially they would receive that that hard violation that in their mind they're they associated with not being absolutely right all the time you will never have a narcissist that uh, accepts his flaws that says i'm sorry or that accept that he was wrong in any way it it just never happens and I would say that is a very big clue at the beginning of a relationship. I, what I do now, uh, because unfortunately I had so many of these in my life, is um, when I start with uh, someone, whether it's in business, in work, or in a relationship, is to test them by pointing out flaws. So I will, re I will see immediately how they react. Are they you know, welcoming the, the friendly criticism? Or are they absolutely obtuse of any flaw that they might have? And I, so I'm, I think it's also very important that we all be always receptive and open to understanding the other and not wanting to be loved so much that we blind ourselves to who, whoever we have in front of us. It's like, love me, love me, whoever you are, just love me. I need to be loved. And I think that blinds a, a lot of people. Um, and then we, we're kind of less in tune to our inner being, to our inside that gives us all these red flags and tells us something is really wrong here because we really want this to be it. We really want this to work. And we want to kind of have this checkbox checked off. I did this. I, I am in this. I'm in this box. Everything's well. I can move on to doing other things because this is, this is now our, I, I'm done with this. I have my partner. I, I, we're going to make it work. And it, that's not how it works. So, uh, but yes, the, it's difficult to know um, how, where it comes from. And it's even difficult to know who attracts them, what kind of personality. Usually they're also shinier personalities, empaths, um, but most of the time it's people pleasers. It's people pleasers who attract the narcissist, who then just as a vampire takes away all the people pleasing out of the person until there's nothing left in the soul, right? Uh, because we want to please so much that, and, and we end up doubting ourselves, then they're very manipulative in making us, like you said, believe that we are the, the, at wrong, we're crazy, we don't know what we're saying, we should be the ones changing. We're not good enough. So all of that eventually, because we're isolated, becomes absolute truth. And we, we end up thinking that there's no other solution until violence kicks in. And very unfortunately, violence does kick in because the power, the power trip just goes further and further of that person. And our boundaries start to go little by little are moved mm -hmm. moved away and then we have at the end no boundaries at all and they can do whatever they want and the day when we wake up and we say wait a minute i had boundaries at some point that's when the violence kicks in yes then they became infuriated in their narcissism how dare you challenge my decision of what is good for you so yes so in any case uh, you know i I'm so grateful we had this conversation. I am so grateful you opened up. Um, I know a lot of people are going to recognize themselves in your story. And I know it's going to open the eyes of a lot of people. You might act at that, as that friend, as that mirror that suddenly someone will see and see themselves and think, wait a minute, that's me. Um, and get out and exit the relationship before it's too late and before kids are involved or or even, you know, this happens at work, this happens in different environments. So 
I'm really, really thankful, Nikki. Thank you oh, so I am much. Too. I learned so much from talking and listening with you, to you. I, really, it was, it was, as I said, it's the first time I've spoken about it. So I'm really, really happy we did this. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. And, I, and if it does help someone, I, I'm, that's why I did it, you know. There's, Thank there's you. I really people. appreciate it. And for, for everyone uh, listening, please join uh, our Facebook group. Go on NarcissisticAbuseVictims.com. Um, you will also see, because we uh, basically uh, take donations, but 50% of what we uh, take goes back into other organizations, such as Victims Voice, such as CT, uh, PSD, so other, uh, also the Domestic Violence Hotline. So we will also give back to other charities who are helping you guys uh, survive, heal, and then thrive, of course, like Nikki said. And I hope you do thrive. So thank you so much once again.